Hey there, folks, and welcome uh, to our event. Uh, tonight we'll be working on, uh, we'll be having Florida Habitats and Ecology uh, with Caroline from uh, Ideas for Us and Orlando Fleet Farming. Um, Caroline is a fleet, uh, Caroline uh, educates us on the five Florida habitats, including the flora and fauna that call these ecosystems home, as well as a conference conversation on native landscaping. Sorry, I haven't really talked too much today. Um, and Caroline is the Chief Operations Officer and Fleet Farming Program Manager at Ideas for Us here in Central Florida. Um, but before we get to that, I just wanted to go through a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, this program was bought to us by the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences. Uh, they've helped us gather some of these um, the cameras and the lighting that we have to deal with, so thanks to them. Um, and this is one of our events in the NEA Big Read uh, series. Um, this is a program from the National Endowment of Arts in partnerships with Art Miss West, Midwest. This year, the Orange County Library System in partnership with Valencia College celebrates Lab Girl author Hope Jaron. Um, we have tons and tons of virtual events that will be taking place uh, starting this past Saturday uh, and all the way through April 24th. Um, but without any further ado, let me introduce uh, Caroline. Caroline, how are you doing? Have you muted here? Me. You'll have to unmute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, everybody. My name is Caroline. I am the Chief Operations Officer of Ideas for Us, as well as the Fleet Farming Program Manager, here to talk to you about Florida habit habitats and ecology, something that I'm super passionate about. Um, being born and raised in Florida, I just absolutely fell in love with the state and I'm excited to bring some of that passion and information to you today. Yeah, thank you so much for um, for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it and we, um, we love ideas for us and fleet farming here. So um, thank you so much. I'll turn it over to you and uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Awesome. So let's get started. Um, during this presentation, if you want to ask a question, make a comment, anything like that, you can use the chat. We really encourage you to talk to us and to have it um, be, you know, a two sided conversation about Florida habitats and ecology and any anything that you want to know. Additionally, please share that with us. Um, we're going to have a Q&A at the end. So let's get started. So um, I'm from Ideas for Us. Ideas is an environmental nonprofit that started here in Orlando, Florida, but has scaled globally. We have branches in Africa, Asia, Europe, and here domestically in Florida. And really the idea of what we try to do is we try to engage the everyday citizen in environmental education and action. Um, the way that we do that is through the five focus areas of energy, water, waste, food, and ecology. Um, at the beginning of every month, we have something called the Ideas Hive, which is a conversation on all these topics. Um, we'll pick a topic for the month, such as solar energy. And at the end of the month, we'll engage in an eco action project on that topic. So we're not just talking about it. We're actually going out and doing something about it. So if you're interested in that, you can check out Ideas for Us on um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, and you can see if you, we have a branch of Ideas for Us near you. And Ideas for Us created the nonprofit urban agriculture program called Fleet Farming. Fleet Farming is how I basically got into the nonprofit as a horticulturalist. And it was really amazing to see something grow um, from something small that people did on the weekends, really, to a big uh, program that's doing things that are pretty impactful in Central Florida. The idea behind this is transforming the average American lawn into a productive micro, micro farm. So with that, let's walk into this Florida environment that we have pictured here. So one of the things that I would love for you to take from this conversation is just being able to identify some plants and some animals that are in the Florida environment. Sometimes when we go on a, a hike or we go into different parts of nature, we don't exactly know where we are and the different organisms around us. As we are part of the Florida ecosystem ourselves, I think it's really important to learn about it. So I thank everybody for being interested in this course today. And hopefully you can walk into a Florida environment and be able to identify either some of the plants, animals, or what habitat you are actually in. So what is ecology? Let's take it back to basics so we can build on this knowledge. So ecology is the study of how living things on earth interact with and rely on other living and non-living things in the environment. 
living things being like plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, insects, right? And then non-living things being things like air, clouds, water, rocks, etc. And when these things are together, they create, you know, an ecosystem. And within, within um, the study of ecosystems, there's a lot of different classification systems, um, whether it's from, um, I have here some of my notes, the cooler, um, AW cooler um, method, or the national vegetation classification method, or, you know, uh, other types of mes- methods that are used. Um, there's different uh, uh, distinctions in how these animals and plants and, and habitats are broken down. So for today's sake, we're going to be using this graphic to identify some key plant communities or habitats in these areas. So a habitat is a home or environment of a plant, animal, or other organism. It provides an organism that um, that lives there with food, water, shelter, space to survive. And it's made up of the biotic, the living things, and the abiotic, the non-living things. So to the right here, um, we see um, 17, really 18, um, more than more than 17 different plant community communities that are uh, laid out here. When you zoom in, you will see more detail on where I assume uh, a lot of viewers are from. It may not be where you're from, um, but I'm looking at this zone 9B, particularly because this is where I am located and this is where the Orange County um, Public Library is located. And some of the plant communities that we see through the color coding is pine flatwoods, we see sand hills, we see cypress swamp forests, and more. So something like these graphics can help you to identify vaguely what is in your area or maybe what was in your area before industry um, and suburbs and all of that, those things that alter the Florida environment came into be. Um, but it can give you a good idea of where you are from in um, terms of hardiness zones in the state of Florida. So from that, I have kind of listed them out with a picture for each type of ecosystem or type of habitat, just so we can see a clear picture. We're going to dive into actually seven different, because I just couldn't choose five of these different habitats. Uh, But here's some that kind of overcompasses these uh, Florida ecosystems for the statewide. So the first thing is uh, coastal ecosystems. And what we mean by that is um, majoritively it has salt water, right? We have our tropical coral reefs that yes, we have off the coast of Florida that are gorgeous. Our inshore marine habitats, our mangroves, saltwater marshes, dune and maritime forests. We have our freshwater wetlands and aquatic ecosystems. Some of my personal favorites, There is absolutely nothing like being in a clear Florida spring, swimming and being able to see animals, maybe manatees. It's a pretty magical experience. Um, And these are more freshwater um, bodies of water. So we have rivers and springs, lakes, swamps, and freshwater marshes. For our upland ecosystems, we have pine flatwoods and dry prairies, scrub and high pine, temperate hardwood forests, south florida rocklands as well the rocklands it may be something that you've never heard of i think it's something that if you wanted to look in after this presentation would be really interesting um and of course with the florida habitats we have a florida food web these are some animals that are florida specific as an example when we're talking about this i think it kind of gives us a view of how interconnected every bean really is in the system, right? You can say like, oh, that apple snail that I just accidentally stepped on doesn't really matter, but it does because it's connected to so many different animals, right? Sometimes we tend to glorify what we call the the charismatic megafauna or the big cuddly animals. But when you think about it, the insects, the grass shrimp, um, the snails as mentioned, all these other animals Um, and lower uh, producer level organisms like our plants, they're so important for creating that system. So then maybe one of our favorite animals can survive. So I think this gives a good idea of that interconnectedness. A bladderwort is a a carnivorous plant that we have in Florida that floats in our waters and produces a flower. It um, doesn't root, so it's just floating around. And it's really cool to see them eat um, microscopic organisms through their bladder-like 
um, systems on their leads. Um, then we have other types of animals working our, our way up, like our beautiful turtles that we have in Florida, our frogs, raccoons, etc., making our way up to our top predators that we have, like the American alligator, the snail kite, not mentioned is the osprey, American bald eagle. So there really is so much. So let's dive into our seven communities um, or plant communities or habitats that we are going to be talking about today. The first one is the Florida scrub. We are at the highest and driest part of, parts of Florida. Uh, we typically can identify this area for the white sand and um, just a really dry environment. Um, I know when you're hiking in Wakiva Springs, it makes your way up to a oak or a, a scrub environment. Um, and some of the plants that call this home are like the scrub oak, um, the Florida rosemary, and um, other types of more dry plants. Some animals that make it super, super special is animals like the scrub jay, which is an endemic species, which means that it only lives in the Florida scrub. So if you were a developer, what kind of environment would you choose to build your houses on? It tends to be high and dry areas, so you don't have to worry about any of our wetlands or things like that. So unfortunately, we've lost a lot of our Florida scrub. Um, but with the protection of the scrub jay, which is, um, I believe it's an endangered animal here in Florida, um, we've been able to protect more and more of these environments. And because that scrub jay only lives in that environment, they're really precious for the story of Florida and for the Florida landscape. Another animal that can call this home, gopher tortoises are more flexible. They live in a, a number of different habitats, but they do like the Florida scrub. Um, and gopher tortoises are what's called a keystone species, which is absolutely amazing because when you think about it, not every animal can burrow like they can. That's something that is a skill that they have really honed in on. And other animals rely on the gopher tortoise to use those burrows. So if a gopher tortoise moves and there's a vacancy, another animal who may not be able to dig such as that um, can come in and live there. Um, also, there has been some um, data that suggests that animals during fires or during nat national natural uh, disasters or events can hide in these burrows. So they really um, offer a lot to the landscape. And a fun fact, um, that I already mentioned is the gopher tortoise is a keystone species. So whenever you see an environment that looks like this, it has the white sand, it has kind of like maybe more like desert-like plants in a way, um, drier environments. Um, this is the Florida scrub. The next one is prairies. So prairies can either come in wet prairie or dry prairie forms. A good example of this is Payne's Prairie, which if you've never been, it's really, really cool. Um, Payne's Prairie used to be full of water, but um, over a, a couple different factors, it has dried up. But certain times of the year, it will fill back up with a little bit of water, not, not through the whole thing, but um, it creates a, a really cool prairie environment. And in these prairie environments, you have to wonder, why are there no trees growing in these areas? Well, it's been told to me by my ecology teacher from college that these areas are typically controlled by perhaps fire and perhaps by water. So the water would discourage a lot of different trees from growing because, um, you know, trees that wouldn't be able to sit in that water for the period of time during the year wouldn't have established roots and fire over certain um, situations where the fire can help to kind of rid the area of these different taller plants. Um, and so some plants that call this home is like the fetter bush and many types of grasses. Um, some animals that we see are the sandhill cranes, which I know if you are an animal lover, whenever we see these beautiful animals that are actually quite large on the side of the road or in a natural, natural environment, it's just so exciting to see them, especially if they're in their little family groups with, you know, a mom, a dad, and a baby. Um, other animals are such as the Florida burrowing owl. Yes, this owl does live in burrows in the ground. Um, very cute. And I would say rare to see. They're not very common, commonly seen as maybe some of the um, uh, owls that live in the trees around where people live, right? Um, like our um, uh, barred owl and things like that. Um, 
So depending on the length of their hyper period determines their wet or dry period of um, their prairies. Awesome. So let's move on. The next thing is a pine flatwood. So that in this habitat, um, this habitat is usually something that, you know, if you're going on a hike in Florida and if you see saw palmetto, right, this plant in the bottom right corner, and if you see pines, usually pinus palustris or a long leaf pine, you usually are in a pine flatwood. Um, these areas are um, home to different types of animals like the Florida black bear, which eats the berries of the saw palmetto. Um, they also eat different types of um, plants throughout these systems, as well as the white-tailed deer. They're not endemic species, meaning that they're only in these environments, but this is where you can find them. Um, pine flatwoods are dependent on fire. So what that means is that certain plants will start to fruit and um, uh, have different reactions when fire is introduced. So whether it is a natural fire caused by lightning or maybe a, a human caused fire through um, our natural lands programs or maybe some not so good uh, avenues, these habitats are well equipped to handle the fire and if not encourage it right with the types of resins that are in the trees and um, the saw palmetto having an infinity to fruit after these fire events. I've seen that on a hike um, in Wakiva Springs. So um, this is F pine flatwood. So, so far, just so our memories are intact, we have our Florida scrub, dry environments. We have our prairies. We have our pine flatwoods with the pines and with our saw palmettos typically. And now let's get into our hammocks or our evergreen hardwood and palm forests. So um, these occur, um, uh, the word hammock occurs where there is an island of one type of ecosystem in the middle of a different ecosystem. Um, sometimes I like to imagine an actual hammock between those types of ecosystems that may have a little bit of a dip um, in terms of having more moisture. Um, and in this case, we show our oak trees, our sable palmetto trees, and this is where some of my favorite animals get to um, come into play, including the Florida bobcat, um, which is so exciting to see. I don't know if anybody wants to share any stories of seeing any of these types of animals, um, but they're super special, um, and as well as the Florida box turtle. Um, other types of animals that live here are like our barred owl and other types of owls that live in the trees. And some fun little things that I like to share with some of my students is that sometimes when you make the same call of an owl, they will make the call back to you. So whether that's an owl call that goes, who hoots for you? Sounds like it's saying who hoots for you. You can say that into a forest, patiently wait, and maybe they will say it back, which is kind of a cool little nature trick. Um, in the salt Sable palmettos are the Florida state tree. Fun fact. So you might just call it a forest, but it is kind of a, a more detailed name and um, association with these types of habitats. The next thing is our wetlands. And I think this is really what makes Florida like a beautiful watercolor painting, right? We have thousands of different wetlands and bodies of water here in the beautiful state of Florida. And wetlands are places where the soil is covered by water for most of the year and water loving plants grow. And let me tell you, water loving aquatic Florida plants is a whole wide world to learn about. Whether you're talking about um, your lakes and rivers, planting with things like pickerel weed, duck potato, um, uh, and uh, different types of plants like that, or if we're talking about some listed here, which is like mooly grass and water lilies, there is native water lily, lily <laughs> there's native water lilies and non-native water lilies too. So that's something definitely that you want to look into. With all the plants mentioned, um, it's really important to have Florida native plants if we want to support Florida native environments. Um, animals that live in these types of ecosystems are like our American alligator, crawfish, wood storks, and just a wide variety of beautiful birds. Um, one of my favorites is a rosette spoonbill. It's an, like an all pink bird um, that usually will be flying over certain wetlands. And wetlands are the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. That means that we have a lot of different plants and animals that live within these types of ecosystems. And it's really dependent as well with the fluctuation of water. 
So even in some sorts of um, marshes, for instance, uh, these types of uh, sharks will come in when it's high tide and lead when it's low. So um, that's one of the things that makes it so interesting with these types of environments. So let's get a little bit more particular. Let's talk about freshwater marshes. Freshwater swamps um, are covered in water similar to wetlands, but usually have many more trees. They usually have cypress trees, um, cedar, tupelo, and um, really interesting plants like I have listed here, which is the ghost orchid, one of the most rare plants that we have in the state of Florida. That yes, sometimes we do have to have a, a form of protection over these plants because they are wild harvested by people usually trying to sell them for their rareness. Um, other animals that live here are the Florida panther um, that can frequent these types of animal uh, habitats for water and many types of frogs. I found it so interesting. I was teaching another class, just the amount of different reptiles we have. We have sirens, we have newts, we have frogs, we have different types of toads. And um, these types of amphibians are really special because um, if, you, if you look up any of those types that I just mentioned for Florida, um, they all live in certain areas and require um, basically like the perfect environment for them to grow, right? And having so many wetlands, wetlands in Florida, it's kind of a whole population of animals that we are a little bit unaware of that's just below the water. Um, the Florida Everglades is home to one of the most famous freshwater march marshes. So if you've ever had the opportunity to go to the Florida Everglades, um, that is considered a freshwater marsh, although it does change some habitats throughout the system, um, but a really cool place for watching animals, um, maybe documenting some plants that you see, and just being able to really feel like um, you have an understanding of the Florida environment, being able to see the Everglades. The last one, which is my favorite, I absolutely love coastal environments. I find it so fascinating and above all, Florida mangroves. And um, I have here listed three, three different types of mangroves plus another type of plant called a buttonwood. And it shows how they sit in the water. We have our red mangroves that are farthest, um, our black mangroves and our white mangroves. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit about mangroves just because they are so interesting. So mangroves are one of Florida's true natives. They thrive in salty environments because they can obtain fresh water from salt water. They secrete excess salt through their leaves while others block absorption of salt on, at their roots. Once I was on a field trip and my teacher actually um, uh, licked one of the leaves of the mangroves to show how salty it was. Florida's estimated 469,000 acres of mangrove forests contribute to the overall health of the state's southern coastal zone. The ecosystem traps and cycles various organic materials, chemical elements, and important nutrients. Mangrove roots act not only as a physical trap, but also provides attachment surfaces for various marine organisms that will attach themselves to the roots. Many of these att attached organisms filter water through their bodies and in turn trap and cycle nutrients. This is my favorite part. The relationship between mangroves and their associated marine life cannot be overemphasized. Mangroves provide protected nursery areas for fisheries, crustaceans, and shellfish. They provide food for a multitude of marine species such as snook, snapper, tarpon, jack, sheep's head, red drum, oyster, and shrimp. Florida's important recreational and commercial fisheries would dr drastically decline without healthy, healthy mangrove forests. So that's why if you're living on a coastal environment, maybe you should reach out to an environmental group who plants mangroves. And I even talked to some groups that plant seagrasses because the seagrasses provide an area for the mangrove seeds to plant themselves to eventually turn into mangrove forests. So if you want to get involved with that, there are some amazing um, groups um, I think one is Tampa Bay Watch. They are one of the best, um, as well as I believe Oceana is involved in some of these types of projects. So do your research, but these environments um, are for these plants that kind of hold themselves out of the water, but provide so many benefits, whether it's animals latching onto the roots or providing a nursery type environment um, for baby uh, animals to grow. One of them in particular is like the nurse shark. 
um, when they're little, when they're big, they're a big part of the top of the food chain, right? But when they're babies, they're fair game for a lot of different animals. So they kind of have to hide themselves in these mangrove spores. So with that knowledge of the different types of habitats that we have in Florida, let's talk a little bit about planting Florida native plants. So it's super important to consider planting native when you are building a garden, because these are the plants that our Florida animals prefer, right? And they're part of us as a landscape. And they can also be easier to grow. If you pick the right plant for the right place, um, as we like to say in the plant world, you will typically have an easier time gardening than to try to fight and have plants that are not from here. So there are some amazing resources. The first one that is really great is FloridaYards.org. They have a Florida-friendly plant database where you can actually put in what type of plant you're looking for, where you're trying to plant it, the water type, the sunlight um, that you have to offer, all the different elements of your garden you can specify in this system. And what it will do is it will suggest plants based on your profile of what you've put into to the system. And so if you just don't know what to plant, this is a really great resource. Another is talking to people who have been in this type of um, conversation and industry for a long time. So your Florida Native Plant Society group um, is all throughout Florida. They have chapters in different areas. I know in my area in Central Florida, I'm closest to the Couplet Fern chapter and the Tar Flower chapter. These are opportunities for you to go to meetings, whether online or in person, to be able to talk to people about um, different landscaping um, plans that you have, or if you just want to get local uh, a local group um, to to volunteer with. This is really great. Um, also, UF, UF IFAS Extension Center is a wealth of knowledge with anything plant related. Um, I can call them up and ask them, hey, what's the best type of milkweed? Because I know that there's this non-native milkweed and I'm supposed to be planting the native and they give so many resources on all of that. Um, they're very educated. And of course, talk to your local plant nursery. Some that I know that sell um, Florida native plants are Green Isle Gardens, Lucas Nursery, South Seminole Farmer Nursery, but there might be a nursery near you where you can call them up talk to them about your project and the sunlight and the water that you have, maybe the type of soil, and they can help to give you recommendations and maybe you can even purchase plants from them. Um, so that's a good idea. And one question I would ask the nurseries or the different people um, that are, you know, our educators to us is um, the length of time for that plant. Are you um, looking to plant something that is an annual, a biannual or a perennial? Perennial, we mean growing all year long. Annual is like the shortest amount of time. Like something like a black-eyed Susan, they will bloom and then they will go to seed. But the seeds are so prolific that usually they come back the next season, right? Um, so just a breakdown of some of these plants and you can totally take a screenshot or just write them down. So we have our canopy trees, which is a various a wide variety of pines, my personal being the Florida pine uh, or the longleaf pine, Pinus plasterus. Um, other canopy trees are a persimmon. Yes, we do have a Florida persimmon. I was surprised too. Um, a slash pine that you usually see growing along the highways, um, sand live oak, blue jack oak, and turkey oak. These are our tallest trees. Underneath that, we have our summer hall, um, our Russi leonia. Chickasaw plum that, yes, is an edible plum. And um, I've seen them growing at beautiful uh, botanical nearling gardens. And uh, it's a really great plant, I would suggest. Sand live oak um, and other plants, as well as a sparkleberry. Um, sparkleberry is pictured in the last picture that I also have recently learned about. Some shrubs that you would want to consider are the scrub palm, the flag pawpaw, Beautyberry, which I will talk about later because it is absolutely amazing. White beautyberry, yeah, it exists and it's in the picture in the middle. Um, Summerhaw, uh, Garberia, Lessionia. Lessionia is um, uh, a common plant, I believe, in the scrub. Um, I know that there is a park land, um, named after Leonia that has a lot of it and that is a scrub. Um, fetter bush, Chickasaw plum, saw palmetto, and sparkleberry. If you want just like the typical Florida 
environment. And if it's in the right area, um, a saw palmetto might be a great plant to, to suggest for that. Vines. So I love planting trellises and um, plants that will just go over it that you can go under and it kind of makes it a magical experience in your garden. Coral honeysuckle is amazing. If you want to see hummingbirds, having those types of flowers that are more trumpet shaped are great for that. And usually um, when I was living at Nearling Gardens, um, I was a caretaker for four years there. I got to live on, on site. Um, I would see the hummingbirds in the morning and it was really special. They're so tiny and so fast. Um, passion flower, which is gorgeous. It's that purple flower on the bottom. They do produce a passion fruit um, and they are a host plant to different types of butterflies, including the Gulf Littleary and the Zebra Longwing. Um, the Carolina Jessamine, uh, which I believe is pictured in yellow flower, and um, the coral honeysuckle, which I guess is different from the honey coral honeysuckle. And here's some pictures of animals that are associated with that. The Gulf Littleary is probably a butterfly that you've seen before, but maybe not have known the name. Um, and they are loving those types of flowers. Although watch out for the red passion flower because some of them are invasive. Ground covers. So we have Indian grass. Um, we have pineland drop seed. Britain's beer grass, golden aster, bavaria, gopher apple. Um, one of them that I like is the um, perennial peanut and the uh, mimosa. Mimosa has like a little, uh, little pink flower attached to it. And of course, sandhill milkweed is really great for attracting those butterflies, including the monarch butterfly wildflowers and there's so many so i'm going to list a bunch but then i'm going to kind of go back to my favorites so we have calamint florida paintbrush coral honeysuckle beard tongue um white uh little white argentina sandhill milkweed and golden aster and depending on where you are your nursery will have plants that are more specific to your area typically so it's good to do that research on putting the right plant in the right place through that resource i shared earlier or just talking to people around you about your specific habitat that you live in. Um, other plants include the pink beard tongue, um, the fairy, fairies, um, prairie clover, wild petunia, rosin weed, ironweed, et cetera. So here's some of my favorites that I've seen a lot of activity on. So the passion flower grows super well as a vine. Um, if in your more wet areas, um, the button bush is a great option just a beautiful bloom that attracts a lot of different types of pollinators because there's so many access points for the insects to um, get into the, the nectar. Cassia, which is a butterfly host plant to the giant sulfur butterfly. Um, and even I believe this plant at night closes its leaves um, and it's really beautiful. It kind of can grow into a, a big bush if you cut it and prune it in the right way. Um, blanket flower, which is very easy to grow in places that are dry and sandy. Um, and the, the head of the flower will um, dry into a seed ball. And you can sprinkle that back into the area or save it. Beautyberry, as mentioned, is a lover of birds. Um, I see a lot of activity on my beautyberry. And something that I've seen in my garden that just has a lot of attention from the pollinators, including bees, different types of bees, is the dotted horseman or the bee balm. It kind of smells a little bit like tires in a way. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a type of mint and uh, it's a really easy plant to grow. It's very rewarding and it's purple and green. Some other common pioneer plants, we don't like to say weeds because weeds is just a derogatory term for a plant that we don't really know, right? So there's some naturalized plants and some Florida native plants that are in the mix here. Naturalized meaning that it's been here for so long. And um, one of those is go to cola, which is, uh, it can be used in herbalism and it is commonly seen in um, the grassy areas. Um, Spanish needle, which you've probably seen before. The flowers are actually edible. It is also used in herbalism and it is a very easy to grow plant that is loved by pollinators. Um, nut sedge, I'm not too quite um, sure of the history of that, but it is a common pioneer species you might see as a type of grass. Dollar weed, these are really fun. They are native to Florida. Um, they usually grow um, in wetter areas, See, sometimes even in our waterways. I've seen them growing in the water at the springs. 
Um, and I believe they are edible too. Clover, which is loved by our marsh rabbits. Um, parsley that is highly nutritious. Um, it is edible. And Florida betony that actually is called the Florida wild radish because the type of rhizome that's in the soil can be eaten. And it's pretty good. And it has these beautiful um, kind of sagey type flowers that pop out of the ground um, so you can identify them. So with that, um, we've kind of gone over what ecology is, our Florida habitats, um, and then also about native landscaping. So if anybody has any questions, I would love to answer them. Um, I'm here to talk about any types of experiences that you have in the Florida environment, plants that you love, plants that you would like to learn more about. Um, so if you have anything, please add it in the chat right now, and we'll give a couple moments for you to do so. Awesome. And if not, no worries. Thank you so much for having me. I absolutely love the Florida environment. I hope that this presentation has shown you a little bit about the, the immense beauty that we have in this state with our plants, our animals, and uh, what we can do to get involved with Florida native landscaping. That was really, really great and informative. Thank you so much, Caroline, for, for coming. I just like, I, I love hearing about like what what we can grow and how easy it is to grow like some of these like absolutely like stunning plants that like you can that just kind of are here because they're they're native and that's they that's where they want to grow <laughs> um and so i'm i'm thinking about redoing my front yard now so we're, we're hoping yes to, you should <laughs> yeah uh we have a few plants there but they're not um but i think we could get quite a few more in there and hopefully get some pollinators in that would be that would be awesome um yeah, um, Pedro says thank you very much. I I agree. Uh, super informative. Um, what do you uh, what do you recommend as the most fragrant wildflowers to plant? This was asked by uh, Chrissy Lindler. The most fragrant fragrant wildflowers to plant. Well, the first one that comes to mind is not so much a wildflower, but my citrus is just going crazy right now. Um, what are the most fragrant? Hmm. That's a good question. I'm not quite sure. Like the dotted horsemint does have a fragrance to it for sure. And I've grown to really like that. Um, but there is a, hmm. I'm not quite sure. Does, if anybody knows, please share. But I'm not having any besides the citrus come to mind lately at least. Yeah. Uh, the citrus does smell outstanding when it comes in so that's that's a great answer but uh mm -hmm. but yeah if you guys have anything to share that would be that would be awesome it would be you know you always picture people smelling roses and such but it would be cool to do that be able to do that with you know something unconventional um yeah jane i it was it is great to to share but um does anyone else have questions for us uh we really appreciate you all coming coming out tonight come staying in and watching out tonight <laughs> whichever it may be but yeah we we really do appreciate you all coming to spend some time with us at least um and and yeah um caroline you are coming back uh to the library here in a little bit um let me get the exact day but we're going to be talking about um herb gardening on the uh 13th of april so two weeks from tonight actually uh we're going to be talking about some some herbs um that we'll be able to to grow here and those can be probably pretty fragrant um we're looking for that but um and then we're also you're also coming back a third time uh with our gardening festival um that is taking place on april 24th um if you um want to come to that please check it out the um we'll, i'll drop the link to the uh big read website it has all the events coming up <clears throat> and including those two um jessica's asking where we could get some seeds for native flowers um you had a slide up there earlier, but do you want to mm -hmm. have a few places to shout out? Yes, there is. Um, FloridaWildflowers.com sells their own types of seeds, as well as um, FLAWildflowers.org. Um, and I know people from the um, Florida Wildflower Association, they have really good resources for that, too. Oh, great. Do, are they local or are they like just? Yes. Just... Yes. Actually, my um, one of my past professors 
uh, leads that organization and um, one of my uh, colleagues works with her and they're absolutely amazing. Oh, awesome. That's that's really cool. That would be uh, that would be a great place to check out. Do you know where they're located, or like, uh, you, you, or do you, if you could say the name again? We can give it a search. Yeah, you can look them up online. The Florida Wildflower Association, I believe it's called, um, as well as uh, FloridaWildflowers.com or FLAWildflowers.org. Those are all great resources. Great, thank you. Um, and. Uh, the, the website, uh, do you have a website that you wanted to share with some more information about your classes or anything like that? Yeah, so you can check out www.ideasforus.org as well as um, fleetfarming.org. Um, like I mentioned, we have so many resources on gardening, typically edible gardening with fleet farming. Um, but we also have YouTube um, channels as well if you want to see us in action. Um, if you want to attend more of our events, you can go to our Facebook page, Ideas for Us Orlando or Fleet Farming. Um, you type that in the search bar and under the events tab, we have all of our different events. We have some really cool things coming up. We have opportunities for you to get involved in tree plantings, shoreline restoration projects, pollinator garden installations, um, uh, Fleet Farming swarm rides, uh, which is farming bicycle rides and so much more. So that is coming soon. Awesome. Uh, we'll be looking forward to, to checking those out and uh, please do visit those um, those websites I, I just linked in the comments. Um, I've There's a lot of great things happening in Orlando, uh, just like, you know, I learned learning about you guys through those uh, the monthly Wednesday um, meetings down at um, the East End Market. But um, but yeah, some really great stuff happening in Orlando. A lot of people just doing what's best for our community. And uh, yeah, you, you folks are at a lot of the heart of that. So thank you so much for, for coming out. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'll see you guys next time. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see you on April 13th uh, to check out more information. I'm going to share that link one last time here. Um, and um, and yeah, uh, please just check us out. Um, check out the events and see you on April 14th, 13th. All right. See you then. Bye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to be the first to find out when we have new fun and informative videos for you. Orange County Library System is your place to learn, grow, connect.